As you know, on the Senate calendar, we have uh, S-169 from last year, which had been together by the governor. Um, S-169 included a number of provisions, um, one of which was a 24-hour waiting period for handgun purchases. Um, at the time last year when the bill went through the Senate and the House, um, the, the data or research uh, basis for the decision about 24 hours, while some people felt that there was an intuitive logic that it would help uh, save lives, uh, others debated whether there was enough research to know whether it conclusively would work or not. So as we contemplate what to do about S-169 or how uh, alternative paths to move forward, uh, we thought it would make sense to have uh, some professionals who are independent who are viewed as effectively the top researchers on uh, the data around waiting periods uh, to come in and, and shed the best thinking and research uh, of the day on the issue so that the committees can uh, make a more informed uh, discussion. I'm very pleased that Dr. Luca from the Harvard Business School uh, who wrote uh, what is essentially the, the the premier paper, I'll say it so they don't have to, uh, on this issue, uh, uh, we're, we're very generous to come up. Uh, they aren't being funded by any group, but they can speak for themselves about the nature of their research and the impetus for it, uh, and hope that they'll be able to shed light on what they believe the research is on um, the safety impacts of waiting periods, uh, and let their data speak for itself, and obviously let people ask as many questions. So I want to thank them, though, for uh, making the hall up this morning for Boston and uh, look forward to hearing what they have to say. Thank you for being here, Senator Dick Sears and Ginny Lyons. We are chairs of the Judiciary and Health and Welfare Committees. Um, and thank you, Senator Rash, for arranging this uh, testimony. Um, we hear always anything to do with firearms as conflicting evidence. And uh, happy to have some actual studies of waiting periods. The best we had when we were developing and drafting the bill was a study out of the University of Houston uh, that indicated there was some benefit, um, but there were two, really too few people um, in terms of both suicide and homicide. And, uh, so uh, please uh, feel free to get started. Thank you, Senators. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes up front, uh, giving a little bit of a background on, on who we are and why we're doing this work, and, and, and generally what the, the data seems to suggest. And then my colleague Mike will then spend a little bit more time on the actual study to give you a little bit more information and hopefully a lot more confidence on the rigor with which this study was done. And as you think about any policy that you want to pass, certainly one of the questions that's going to be, well, is it going to make any difference? And, and our hope is that uh, if there's one objective that we achieve with the time that we have together, it's that you'll have a lot of confidence that if this policy passes, if the objective is to, to reduce gun deaths, that that would be something that would be uh, something you can uh, very much expect. Uh, let me start by just saying again, my name is Deepak Malhotra. Uh, I've been at Harvard on the faculty since 2002, uh, so this is my 18th year. Uh, I'm an academic, uh, a scholar, I do work in a lot of different areas. Uh, more to the sure. Thank you. Yeah, no uh, so I've been at Harvard since 2002. This is that's a lot better. <laughs> Uh, this is my 18th year, and uh, Mike Luca, he's uh, been at Harvard Business School since 2011, and uh, we've been colleagues, and we've been doing this work together since uh, a little after 2012. And what got us into the uh, area of gun violence in general uh, was what happened in Sandy Hook. Uh, when the shootings in Sandy Hook happened, uh, neither one of us was studying the issue. Uh, but the two of us ended up meeting for lunch a couple of days after, and everybody in the country was talking about what happened to those children. And uh, you know, I have little kids, and Mike does now, I don't think he did at the time. Um, and after talking about uh, the tragedy for about an hour, we were about to just go back to our offices and get back to work. Uh, and then one of us said something like, well, so what are we going to do about that now? Just go back to work, right? And then we sort of paused, and we thought, well, well what could we do about it? Uh, and uh, we didn't care to say, hey, maybe we should donate some money to some cause. And, and we quickly uh, assessed our assets and we realized that the one thing we do have going for ourselves is that uh, 
for academics. Uh, we know how to do research. Uh, and we have research budgets that we're allowed to use however we think is important. So maybe we can spend some time just trying to understand uh, gun violence. Uh, with no agenda whatsoever other than let's just at least educate ourselves on this issue that creeps up every so often. People have a lot of different theories, a lot of different models for why things work the way they do, um, different interests about how to solve these things. Let's just try to understand it. We spent the first couple of years just scouring the research and understanding what's been done, what hasn't been done, what's been proposed, where there's evidence, where there's no evidence. And eventually we decided to look at the question of what might actually solve some of these problems. Not completely, uh, but what might make a difference? And uh, we don't have any uh, ties to any lobbying groups. We don't have any ties to any special interest groups. The, the research is not funded by any outside group. Uh, we started looking at waiting periods. And the reason we started looking at waiting periods is because uh, there's two questions, at least from our perspective, that always get asked when people think about whether or not any legislation should be passed, uh, in particular with regards to uh, gun violence. And the two questions is, one, uh, is there any reason to believe this would work? Uh, why pass legislation just to pass legislation? Why pass a law just to put one more thing on the books which will do nothing? So the first question is going to be, can this make a difference? And there was already uh, research out there that suggested theoretically waiting periods might make a difference. And Mike will talk a little bit more about why that is. Uh, what happens in the short amount of time when somebody is either feeling very depressed or very angry and the kinds of decisions they might make at that time. The second question, uh, which is not necessarily a question scientists always find themselves asking, but I think is important for everybody in this room, which is even if we could show uh, that there is an impact, that we could save lives by having something like a waiting period, um, what about the idea that, you know, there's, you know, second amendment rights that we need to protect and, you know, we should be taking guns away from folks, etc. And what waiting periods do is that, as we'll show, they can save lives and we can show that empirically uh, while respecting the second amendment rights of people, not taking guns away from a single person, without any more restrictions on uh, people's right to own a gun. So that made it a compelling thing for us to study. And it turns out that the results are pretty strong. Uh, we'll get into those in just a moment. But in addition, uh, the majority of Americans, and the, the same pattern holds in Vermont from the data, the little data we've seen that's on it, a uh, majority of Democrats, majority of Republicans, a majority of gun owners, a majority of non-gun owners support the idea of waiting periods, probably for the same reasons that I just articulated, which is that by introducing just a brief delay between uh, the decision to purchase a gun and then having that gun delivered to you uh, or picked up by you, uh, we can reduce homicides and suicides. And notably, the, the polling data that's been out there, uh, that's been out there, is before we even had the strong evidence that we're going to share with you. So even maybe intuitively, people have thought that this could be a good idea, but now we're at a point where we can make a much more compelling case that says, well, your intuition, if this was your intuition, uh, happens to be uh, quite accurate. And so with that, I'm going to hand this over to, to Mike, and he's just going to go through some slides uh, that provides a little bit more context onto what we're studying, and then digs in a little bit more into the actual research. And from our point of view, uh, we welcome any and all questions. Uh, absolutely anything that you want to ask about, you should feel free. Uh, don't censor yourself in any way on our behalf. Um, if we can't answer your question, we'll of course let you know that. But uh, our hope is that there's, uh, by the time we're done in this session, there's no question that's still left in your mind about the results, about the empirical evidence, about, well, what about this or what about this, anything like that. We hope that the time we have together will help resolve those issues. And with that, I'll hand it over to Mike, and then soon after that, we'll go to questions. Uh, so the research that we're going to be talking about today comes from a recent paper that, we had that was published in PNAS. Yeah. The papers on the impact of handgun waiting periods, on um, uh, gun homicide, and on gun suicides. Let me just start with a little bit of the uh, background on this. 
And so, you know, as Deepak was mentioning, you know, when we started thinking about this issue, it became clear that gun, that gun deaths are a major issue in the United States. So according to the CDC, there were about 40,000 gun deaths across the U.S. in 2017. Uh, there's a mix of homicides and suicides uh, that are account for this number. So about two-thirds of gun deaths are suicides. Uh, we did plot out the gun power Vermont uh, compared to the rest of the uh, United States in terms of suicides, and it looks like the suicide rate is kind of on the higher side of this, which I suspect is part of what prompted this bill to begin with. Yeah. We walk a little bit through the rationale for a waiting period. So as Deepak had mentioned, when we went into this study, uh, we didn't just want any uh, wait, any type of gun policy. We were thinking about things that uh, we thought might potentially have support, but also things that we thought prior research suggests might have an impact on behavior. So to give a sense of what we had in the back of our mind to motivate the study of this, uh, there's growing research within psychology and behavioral economics on the nature of emotions, and in particular, the fact that uh, emotions can be transient, so you can feel depressed now, but not 36 hours from now or 48 hours from now. Uh, you can feel angry and ready to commit violence, and that can go away over time. So there are some references in here that are also in the paper that was distributed if people want to read more about this. And once we start thinking about the transient component of emotional states, and you can imagine that violence or self-harm uh, has the potential to be more likely in hot states. And kind of outside of the context of, uh, of gun violence, there's been some uh, research on this, for example, looking at domestic violence in hot states uh, versus cold states. Now, thinking about how, as a policymaker, you might design a policy around this, you can imagine that even putting a little bit of a waiting time, a little bit of a period to allow somebody to cool off and transition from a hot state to a cold state could have a persistent impact on um, health and well-being of people. So yeah, thinking about this, we started looking at the landscape of waiting periods. And thinking about waiting periods as something that has the potential to just kind of reduce uh, reduce your access uh, to a firearm at the moment when you're in a hot state and to still kind of allow you to get this 48, 24, 36 hours afterwards. Yeah. So we wanted to see what the data would say about the causal effect of waiting periods on gun deaths. Because even though we had seen uh, resource to justice might be effective, we wanted to get direct evidence on uh, the policies that have been implemented over time that have implemented uh, waiting periods. And what we realized is that many states have already implemented or removed waiting periods over time. So if you were to kind of look around, you'd see that uh, for one reason or another, there have been 44 states that have had variants of waiting periods implemented over the last few decades. Now, some of these were changed intentionally, thinking about implementing a waiting period. And some had a waiting period that was put in place, but more to support something else, like to provide time uh, for background checks or other things. Uh, and what we wanted to do in our analysis is take advantage of all the data we could find uh, on changes in waiting periods to get a sense of, uh, do waiting periods impact gun deaths? So, we took this and used a couple of different methods that are common in the toolkit that economists have developed in recent decades for trying to get a sense of whether an estimate is causal or not. Uh, so I'll just walk a little bit through the methodology to give a little bit of a sense of what's going on underneath the hood in our paper and what we were looking at in the data. Of course, when thinking about that, uh, if you were just to look at uh, states that have waiting periods and compare cross-sectionally to states that don't, you might say, oh, there are other things different across those states. So uh, one way to get around this is our first approach, which is called the difference in differences uh, strategy. So essentially what we wanted to do is find the timing at which different states either implemented or removed a waiting period. And then essentially what we look at is either looking for jumps or drops in gun deaths in the states that had a change in their waiting period policy. Uh, relative to the states that had no changes. So notice that what that allows us to do is we're no longer just kind of comparing cross-sectionally across states, but now we're kind of looking for the discrete changes that happen after each state has implemented this. And essentially what we're doing is a variant of taking the average effect across the states uh, of the implementation of that policy and controlling for anything else that might have been happening over time. 
in this first strategy, we look at data from 1970 to 2014, and uh, all 44 of these states uh, that I, I've implemented waiting periods for this. Uh, and beyond the controlling for the specific state and for the specific time, uh, what we do is we put in a host of control variables for other things that might have been changing, such as demographics at the state level, uh, that might have also been affecting the number of gun deaths to kind of uh, convince ourselves that this is a causal estimate that we're picking up on. Yeah. So I'll walk through what those results are, but that's sort of like the first basic uh, approach that we took. That is it. Well, one possible concern with a difference in different strategy is that this may have been uh, adopted at a time uh, when you were looking to do uh, other things as well. So maybe we're not just picking up on waiting periods, but there's always the potential that uh, something else is going on. Now, we did our best to control for all the other main things we think might have been going on, but we wanted to kind of take a second approach to sort of cross validate our results for our main estimation strategy. Uh, I just want to clarify exactly why we need the second strategy to be just doubly short. Somebody could argue that isn't it possible that a state passed a waiting period law right when gun deaths were going to go down anyway? That there's something else going on across these 45 years which is correlating with the decision specifically for a waiting period law, not other laws that we might have looked at. But waiting period laws just happen to show up right when for completely other reasons a state was going to see a decline in suicides or homicides. Now, to solve that problem, to, you know, it's, some people might say, well, that's a little bit far fetched given how many controls you have, but let's take it seriously. It could be true. Ideally, what you want to do in a situation like that is you want an experiment. Force some states to take a waiting period and not force other states to take a waiting period and see what happens. And what you're then essentially doing is saying nobody chose to take a waiting period. Experimentally, they were just forced to do it from the outside. Now, that doesn't usually happen. You don't usually run experiments with states in, in, in our country. But it turned out that in this case, an experiment was essentially run, where from the outside, some states were forced to have a waiting period, even those that would not have wanted it themselves. It's what we call a natural experiment. Nobody designed it to run an experiment, but naturally that's what happened in the 1990s because of the Brady Act. And that's what we're going to get into, which is what happens when nobody chose a waiting period, but it was implemented from the outside on them. Do you still see that same effect? So it's not a choice correlation. So as uh, Deepak was suggesting, essentially you know, we're looking for are things that uh, could help to approximate an experiment. So essentially something that's going to give us plausibly exogenous variation in the implementation of a waiting period in some states but not in other states. And the Brady Act did a version of this, and let me kind of walk through a couple of the details of it. Um, so the Brady Act had a focus on background checks, but while implementing the background checks, they also imposed a five-day waiting period for some number of years during the process. Um, so this is during the Brady interim period, you know, while they were sort of getting the incident check system in place. Now, the thing that allowed us to uh, get an extra variation on this is the fact that not every state was subject to the new uh, waiting periods that were being imposed. So some states already had a waiting period, so they would have uh, been exempt from it. Uh, some states uh, were exempt altogether, so then because they already had a background check uh, system that met the criteria. Uh, so that gave us two sets of states that weren't getting this new waiting period, and a bunch of other states that were getting a new waiting period. And all of this was sort of just imposed from this federal act, so not driven by other state-specific things that might have been passed at the same time. And, and so what we did is then we run that analysis for about a 10-year span uh, to sort of tightly focus on the period before and after uh, the changes in those states uh, to cross-validate against our other results looking at the data from 1970 to 2014. And again, what we're going to be looking for there is also a version of a difference in differences, but exploiting this natural experiment, we're going to look at the change in gun deaths in states that were subject to the new waiting period relative to the change in gun deaths uh, that were not subject to the new waiting period that was imposed on other states. And once we have the data in hand and these two different identification strategy, we were allowed to uh, get a better sense of what's the causal impact of putting a waiting period into place. And again, so what we found is ultimately there are very similar results across the two uh, different sets of analyses. And uh, across them, we found that the waiting period seemed to reduce gun homicides by about 17%. 
Yeah, then this is going to be controlling for other things and also using this natural experiment created by uh, the Brady Act. Then we found that while the estimates kind of were a wider range when looking at suicides, the data suggests that waiting periods reduce gun suicides by about 7 to 11%. Yeah. And I'm thinking about this in cross both of these, we're controlling for other factors like background checks, other gun policies, demographic uh, trends. Uh, if you look into the paper, you'll see we have a number of other falsification exercises to kind of convince ourselves that this is actually waiting periods that we're picking up on and not something else. So looking at this, this kind of convinced us that uh, in that waiting periods seem to have a causal effect on the number of gun deaths uh, at the state level. And, and finally, kind of in the paper, we wanted to do a little bit of a calibration to say, okay, so this is having an effect, but kind of how big is this effect? So is this a meaningful uh, number to be thinking of, or is this just kind of a statistical artifact? And I think kind of putting, looking at the percent change already tells us that this is a big impact on the total uh, number of gun deaths, but we could also think about this in terms of the number of lives saved if this were to be implemented nationwide or kind of in, um, in a given state. Uh, so currently 15 states have waiting periods. And to give a sense of the magnitude here, if all states were to implement a waiting period, our data suggests that this would save an additional 900 homicides and an additional 950 suicides per year. Yeah, so I'm just gonna stop there. And this kind of is what, what's contained in the paper. And I'll point out that everybody has a draft of the uh, paper. And we also have the one page summary that we have distributed as well. And just to clarify one thing, uh, 15 states that have waiting periods, uh, there's two categories of those. Uh, some states specifically have a waiting period, not in line with what you've been considering. Other states have a de facto waiting period because they have some other law in place that creates a waiting time before some, so if there's a permitting system, for example, and that takes X number of days, then that essentially creates a waiting period. Either one of those can act as a waiting period because the mechanism underlying this uh, we suspect is that cooling off period. So you may have a specific waiting period, you may have some other thing that acts like a waiting period, and some states have both. Uh, and any questions are? Yeah, I have a couple, and others may, if we can, sure. if it's okay at Absolutely. this point. Um, my first question is, uh, is there any magic to the number of days for a waiting period? Uh, we, That's we, a yeah. we, in our bill, that, the governor vetoed, we had 24 hours, and that was a compromise between members of the Senate Judiciary Committee in developing a bill. Uh, originally, it called for 48. There's other bills that call for 72. There's states with much longer waiting periods. Is there any magic to the number of days? Uh, so I can tell you what we know and what we don't know on this. In the range of, we could only study the things that have been tried. Right. Uh, the range was typically from a low of about three days to a high of about 10 days. Uh, now, we didn't find any difference across that range. So the one short answer, but an incomplete answer, would be to say the lengthier ones aren't having a better impact than the shorter ones. The more complete answer would be to say, but that's clearly true in the range that we saw. Uh, but we can't necessarily extrapolate beyond that. Uh, so you have to sort of think about, well, what's the underlying mechanism? If the idea is to cool off, uh, is 72 hours significantly more than 48 hours, or are both of those, for example, enough to, to cool off? Uh, so that's what the data shows. Um, I can tell you sort of anecdotally, uh, the US House, uh, there's a bill now based on this research in the US House of Representatives um, they decided to go with the 72-hour one. Uh, they had some of the same questions, which is, is there a magic number or like a minimum number that you need? Uh, and we can't answer it any more than to say we didn't see any difference across the lens, but there's only a certain range that we could evaluate because those are the only ones that were uh, in the data. Um, second, yeah, I've got another. Second question. I, you started out with majority of Americans support waiting periods, yeah. you know, whether it be gun owners, uh, yeah. you listed a whole group. And what I heard from a lot of, and I've generally um, not supported bills that are like the one that 
I did vote for that the governor vetoed. <clears throat> I did that because I believed it would um, make a difference. But many of my constituents said to me, but this, you know, you may think this is okay, but what you just started was a slippery slope. And once you do this, then you get the Beto O'Rourke yelling, yes, we're going to take your guns away. And that was kind of a reaction from many of those folks who had uh, a real fear of what is happening. Is there any, did you get into any other gun legislation? Um, for example, uh, bans on weapons, bans on magazine clips, that sort of thing. Or did you stick to waiting periods? Uh, let me say a couple things about this. First, this is a problem uh, that we all face in society, which is this, uh, whether it's legitimate or not, this, this mistrust that exists, which is to say, fine, we're willing to do certain things, but how do we know you're not going to take this and then just do a lot of other things that are maybe not right, maybe that are not supported empirically, maybe. And yes, this is a problem that actually is on this side of the table. This is exactly what uh, we as a society need to confront, and I think you confront every day. Uh, as scientists, we don't have an answer to that. Uh, we can only tell you what would save lives. But the idea that your constituents, fairly or unfairly, legitimately, or for, uh, for, for other reasons, believe that the downstream risk is that even though we did something really good today, may lead you to one day do something worse, is something that we can't solve with, with this kind of research. And that is a problem that we need to all confront, is to say, does that mean we do nothing? And, and, and that is squarely in, in, in your world and, and less than ours. Uh, I have a, a view on that. I think we should do what we can. But I acknowledge that some people have legitimate fears and those also need to be addressed. And that trust does need to be built. And you do need to sort of say, you know what? We're going to take a stand and, and really focus on the things where we have either very strong empirical evidence or very good theory that suggests this should work. But we're not going to just uh, willy-nilly uh, throw out ideas. Um, but I'm speaking more for, for me and maybe for us, but not for some. This is just that's a problem in society. Uh, did we look at bans and say, uh, no. What we started with was to, what well, we control for other laws to make sure that there's no uh, effect of something else that we're picking up. But the reason we went with waiting periods is because there was theory to suggest, uh, behavioral science, psychology suggested that something like this could make a difference. Uh, and that led us to think about whether this would actually work out or not. There's people out there um, who do research. Uh, sometimes they publish it in uh, academic journals. Often they just put it out there. Uh, and what you'll find is that every study they ever do points in the same direction. Uh, every study they will do will either show there should be no restrictions on guns or there should always be restrictions on guns. In the scientific community, we don't consider that science. I mean, if you have two or three studies in a row that happen to show one thing, yeah, maybe that happens to be what you intend to focus on. But if everything that you say is in one direction, um, you may be a perfectly good person and you mean well and you really believe this is the case, but at some point you're losing credibility as a scientist. Um, our primary identity is as academics and scientists. If we were to find a gun policy that we study that showed actually we can show empirically would make no difference, we would be just as motivated to put that out there. And, and the reason is not just as scientists. Going back to your initial question, that's what allows us to build that trust in society. That when we think something works, we, we, we put it out there. When we think something doesn't work, we put that out there. And our hope, in fact, the next project we're thinking about working on is to scour the earth for all the best research and let people know we're interested in maybe doing something. Uh, which laws seem to help and which laws seem to hurt? Which gun restrictions seem to actually save lives? Which ones there's no data on but might? Which ones seem not to work? Which loosening of gun laws might save lives and which would not? And so your question is a question that we've heard a lot. Uh, we don't have great answers for it. We have great empathy for it. Um, but, but I think uh, but, but you stuck to this waiting period, which is extremely helpful yes. in terms of our my final question really I, oh, I'm sorry. So I'll just add uh, one more thing to that, which is a little bit of extra context. Um, is that when people say, oh, how many new gun bills are going to be uh, proposed or enacted? So 
we have looked at some data on this, and uh, actually there have been a lot of gun bills that are proposed and enacted over time. If you look across states, there are kind of thousands of proposals that have come out across the U.S. over the last 40 years or so. But um, the thing that uh, we started thinking about, which was part of our motivation in this project, is to now get more systematic about thinking about what the evidence says about which of these are are likely to be effective. So uh, rather than just kind of saying, you know, 10 things that people could try, try to focus on if you were to find two or three things uh, that sort of have the broadest support and the most evidence and sort of like uh, triangulate on that part of the world. And that sort of will let us down the path of getting interested in waiting periods. Final question for me is, the, there were, um, you figure 900 homicides, 950 suicides, additional saving of lives. In Vermont, our studies indicate roughly 90% of the firearm deaths are suicide versus about 10% murder, and most of those murders are intimate partners or people well known to each other. They're not necessarily folks that which indicates it might be impulsive, by the way. Um, but uh, so we luckily have a very low murder rate, but a very high suicide rate. And I'm wondering if if, it would indi if there's any indication um, one way or the other regarding those numbers, what Vermont might expect if we were to institute a waiting period. Uh, well, uh, so the best we can say is, so even if you look at it nationally first, if it's 17% uh, reduction in gun homicides, and less than that, almost, let's say, roughly half of that in terms of suicides, at first cut, one might think, well, okay, so the reduction in homicides is going to be greater, but because more deaths are suicides, that 7 to 11% actually adds up to at least as many as, as the homicides, if not more. And I suspect something similar would be expected in Vermont, which is to say, if the number is 7 to 11 percent in Vermont, uh, that's going to account for a lot of those deaths. Now, I mean, that still leaves 90 percent, right? So it's, this is not a magic wand. This is not getting rid of everything. But it's not just the individual. Every one of those deaths has an impact on a family, on a community, on the entire state. So, so the impact is the number per year multiplied by all of the impact it has on other folks, but we can't be precise about the exact number it would be in any one year in one state. This is the estimate. Thank you very much. Senator White and then Senator Booth. I just had a question if um, you could give more examples maybe of the de facto waiting period, um, if you had some or how we would. As in which states have those or No, but just, I mean, one example you pointed out is permitting. Yeah, that's, I think, the main one, that, right? Yeah, so if you have a permitting system for handguns, that ends up requiring some time. I'm not, so uh, I think back in the day, the idea of needing a background check before there was, so the reason the Brady Act even yeah. came in was because instant background checks were not a thing. Okay. And the only reason the Brady Act even imposed waiting periods was because they needed to make sure there was time to do a background check. So for a while, background check was another example of exactly what you're asking. But I think those would probably be the two main. Now we have some background checks in many places, so that was a reason some people removed their waiting period. So maybe I should speak to this. There was a lot of focus on background checks in the 90s, and it had an impact on uh, legislation, et cetera. But when instant background checks became more common, states then removed their waiting period because they had originally only put them in to facilitate the background check based on reading. And what our research would suggest is, no, no, they were having their own independent effect that you've now lost by removing them. They weren't just helping do a background check. Even if you have a background check, on top of that, a waiting period actually saves incremental lives. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Senator Burley. So thank you for coming, first of all. Um, I, was, uh, I was interested to hear that your work started after Standy Hook. That's when my interest in the subject um, spiked to. I think the same is true for many people around the room. It's striking to me that when these incidents happen and then nationally there's no legislation passed, we, we tend to say nothing Nothing happened that time. Nothing happened again this time. Nothing happened again this time. But there has been a change. And your research is a, a really crucial part of that especially since the federal government largely um, prohibited research in many ways or into it. Um, 
I did want to ask, I was, the most surprising thing about your findings for me was the 17% reduction in gun homicides. I hadn't been expecting that there would be an almost double effect on homicide, um, because I knew that suicides were a much larger component of the overall deaths. Do you, do you have any either data or personal theories about why waiting periods are so much more effective in preventing homicide um, as opposed to, because as you say, a cooling off period, um, emotions change over that period of time. Obviously radically different sets of emotions, but any, any thoughts on the differences between the percentage of effect? So I was just confirm that you can we agree that we're just speculating at this point. Sure. So if you have any theories, I mean, <laughs> you ask an academic if they have any theories, you know, we can take out the entire whole <laughs> of theories. Uh, many untested and, and, and so um, I, I didn't have any, I don't think, and I've known this data for so long, it's sort of hard to reflect back before you knew the outcome, what your expectation was. I don't think we have any priors that were strong one way or the other, because there's two different kinds of emotions we're talking about here. Right, somebody's, somebody's angry, somebody's uh, angry at someone else. Uh, they were able to obtain a firearm in short order. Uh, the opportunity and the anger is still there, then they might use it. Um, uh, when, when you're depressed, when you're, you're at, and, and everybody's been at some low point, but, but think about being at that point where you're, you're willing to end your life. That level of low point happens, and you're able to, to find a firearm. Uh, that's a different emotion. Um, could it be that, uh, the person who is in a, in a depressed state um, eventually gets to that same depressed state again uh, in some future time. And so maybe you stop them once, uh, or they don't do it, but maybe the next time it happens, they're still able to act on it. Maybe that's different than what happens in a very, very angry moment, in terms of the likelihood that they will be just as angry and willing to take those action. Maybe there's a difference between those two kinds of things. but. That, those, that level of mechanism, we, we haven't been able to say we don't have that kind of data, so we would be speculating on that. Um, I don't know if you want to add, add something to that. Yeah, so, yeah, so I agree with that. And so we, we don't really have you know, the data to say, and I share kind of the intuition not going into it. We didn't have strong priors about where we'd see uh, the larger effect. I guess another component uh, that made us uncertain about where the bigger effect would be going in was that other things are changing in homicides to like kind of your, there may be like kind of a more, like a shorter time frame during which you have the, that you have kind of the odd uh, like situational opportunity uh, to commit the uh, homicide the one was looking to commit. So uh, there are other things going on that make it hard for us to sort of infer. Um, you know, one piece of cross-factor validation uh, we did also is kind of thinking at the mechanism level, and I mentioned this before, there are other uh, studies, for instance, like looking at uh, domestic violence that have found kind of that um, that transitory emotions make a, make a difference, and that's kind of like same day uh, level of violence. Uh, so, for example, they'll look at um, ARDA fans and big football games and unexpected wins and losses is the type of uh, exercise people kind of look at and see spikes in violence toward others. So uh, it didn't surprise us per se that we saw kind of an effect on uh, um, actions toward others as well. But the one, one thing I will say, and it sort of implied earlier, which is uh, at the end of the day, it's about 10% of the suicides. And for maybe the reason that we were just speculating, but more generally, uh, this isn't the only answer. We, there more needs to be done uh, to, to help with this problem. Uh, again, that never means don't do anything that you can do, but this is not to say, all right, well, we've checked the box on, on suicides or even gun suicides specifically, uh, but hopefully this is something that saves uh, very specific individual lives. So I, I have a question. Um, so, uh, I, and I apologize, I haven't had an opportunity to read the full uh, publication, but um, as, you're, as you were going through and thinking about the other variables that contribute to suicide and trying to eliminate some of those variables, you know, so it was only the waiting period. Can you talk a little bit about what you discovered, what you eliminated, how you eliminated, and maybe there are some things that are outstanding that point us in a new direction, but 
Uh, not to say that the waiting period isn't the right direction at this point, but uh, some of the other maybe social uh, or emotional uh, contributors to uh, suicide and homicide that you found. So, uh, so one kind of just clarification point that I would make about the uh, about the empirical approach that we took uh, is that our approach wasn't to kind of say let's kind of one by one control for other things that we can do, but more to find uh, something that led to the implementation of a waiting period that was unlikely to also change all these other things that were going on. So when thinking about the Brady Act example, uh, finding the states where uh, we could kind of narrow in on the couple of years before and the couple of years after and sort of start to see uh, kind of this Brady imposed waiting period was associated with sudden changes in uh, the number of suicides, right? So kind of looking for a plausibly exogenous variation in the implementation of a waiting period, then you say, okay, it's much less likely that kind of demographic changes or social or emotional conditions are changing in a way that will be correlated with uh, uh, states that were differentially impacted by the Brady Act. Um, so in a sense, it's kind of looking for these looking for these changes that were almost as good as an experiment uh, in terms of states that got it, and then sort of uh, looking at the just before and just after years to identify what the effect was. Yeah. So, so I, I would think of it as, uh, imagine you wanted to figure out whether you should have a safety belt law. Um, one approach to thinking about studying safety belts would be to say, well, let's compare across everything that can save lives in a car accident and see where sort of safety belts rank on that and what other things like, uh, you know, a better signage on the street and, you know. And if somebody was interested in saying, well, do safety belts save lives? They would design a study, kind of like we did, that would say, okay, we notice that people that wear safety belts are less likely to die than people that don't. But how do we know it's not that they're just safer drivers who tend to also wear safety belts? So let's control for their safety record in accidents. Well, how do we know that uh, maybe drunk people are the ones that aren't the ones that are usually so let's control for that? So you start chipping away at other explanations that were really driving the saving of lives and making you confused and thinking it was safety belts. And when you cross out all those other alternatives, you say, no, actually, yes, drinking and driving is bad, and yes, being a bad driver is bad, but in top of all of that, safety belts save lives. Okay, now we can feel confident that that might be worth pursuing. That's how we did this one. A different study with probably different data, uh, you would probably need different data, would be to say, okay, well, what other things cause somebody to commit suicide? Right? Or what other things uh, might be good interventions for someone who's really at that moment of, of despair? Um, but that's not what we did because it wasn't like controlling for something that would affect the waiting period implementation of a law. So it's, it would be a different kind of study that we didn't quite do. So we don't have, but there are, there's experts out there whose job is to look at those factors, right? Just to say what drives somebody to make that decision, what kinds of interventions help, um, how, do, how do we do those things, and that just doesn't have to be us. Uh, Senator Ring. Uh, thank you. I have uh, two questions for you, Esther, actually. Um, uh, one of the things that we hear um, frequently is that um, the measures that we take to try to save lives also, um, you know, infringe on the rights of, uh, of gun owners who buy guns for self-defense or for uh, for sporting purposes. I, I, were, were there any? Is there any way that, from your data, that you can tell if sales for those purposes were um, adversely affected by uh, by these waiting periods? Uh, our study doesn't look at sales, but as we were discussing this earlier, there is another study, and we can get to that study uh, by Professor Glazer. Um, they looked at different data uh, that wasn't the, the same kind of analysis we did, but they used uh, a different kind of survey data. And, and I believe their research showed that uh, implementation of waiting periods do not reduce gun ownership. Now, um, is gun ownership the perfect measure of any particular sale at a particular moment? Well, I don't think you can get that granular. Uh, we can't speak to any one specific incident. Uh, the second thing I'll say about what you've uh, mentioned is, is hunting and stuff. These are handgun waiting periods is, is what we looked at, and a lot of hunting is not with handguns. Uh, so, so that is usually carved out uh, in some ways, but that doesn't mean that uh, those aren't equally relevant, it's just that, that that's what we looked at. Um, and 
the, the last thing uh, I'll say about this is that the self-defense element of what you ask. Is it possible that there's someone out there who doesn't already own a gun, wanted to buy a gun, uh, who was feeling threatened, who if only they had been able to get a gun within that same hour or whenever they went, would have then been able to protect themselves because somebody was going to attack them that same day, and they would have had that gun at that time, and they would have been able to use it in self-defense. So you don't have to multiply a bunch of probabilities, but uh, is it still possible? Of course it's possible. Now, we don't have very many even anecdotes of, of those being the, the problem. But the nice thing, uh, so to speak, about this analysis is that it already nets all of that out. If that was happening at any high level, we wouldn't find the results of saving lives. We'd see that waiting period maybe increase homicides. If anything, if there might be, if there's always, a, it's, there's probably a situation where if only a person wasn't wearing a safety belt, they would have survived. Because maybe they got scrambled by their safety belt, or the, the people that came to save their life after the accident couldn't get them out there. There's always individual incidents that we can't pick up. But the preponderance of the effect seems to clearly be in the other direction. Uh, that's why we're finding the effect on homicides going down rather than up, and suicides going down. That, that one's more easy to understand. My second question. I'm sorry. Um, um, I'd like is, to follow up on your question. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the bill in question was S 169. It only applied to handguns, not rifles. So, following up with what you just said about the handgun, is there, a, is there any evidence in your study regarding waiting periods divided, not all firearms? Uh, no, we looked at so uh, you know eighty some percent I think of say for example homicides are done by handguns. I think a high percentage of suicides have the same uh, thing. So so what we studied actually uh, suggests that the percentages we've told you should relate to the bill you have if what you're also talking about is handguns. Now if somebody wanted to uh, also add other guns, the percentage could only go up. It can't go down. It may not go up. We don't know. We didn't study what happens if you, you know, uh, you know, address one that's rifles or anything. Uh, but we didn't look at that, and it looks like you're not looking at that. So the percentage is showing that bottom. I'm sorry. No problem. Um, uh, is there any way for you, or did you uh, break down the reduction in suicides and homicides by uh, factors like age and gender and um, race? Uh, do you, you know, were there any particular cohorts that um, reduced uh, these acts more than others? So, so we control for those, I think all the things you just mentioned, uh -huh. race, age, and birth. Uh, so we have that in there to see if we can pick something up. I don't think we picked anything up, but one of the things that happens is at some point you start losing degrees of freedom. The, the, the statistic power to be able to look at it goes down the more you try to cut the data into smaller and smaller components because you don't have enough data in, in each uh, category. The other thing is the data that we had often was at the level of state demographics rather than each individual death. So we aren't looking at the likelihood that somebody within the age range of this to this commits suicides, right? We don't have that in this uh, analysis, right? Uh, that would be an additional analysis. This sort of just controls for, well, maybe the states that have waiting periods tend to have an older or younger population. Uh, where they have a different racial uh, demographic, or they have a different dot, 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 uh, different economic situation. So, so this controls to make sure we're not erroneously, uh, again, erroneously suggesting waiting periods are doing the work when it's really just states are different. So that's what this one does. But we don't, we aren't able to get into uh, which deaths specifically within suicides or homicides were the ones that got reduced. And which, by the way, I think is a very interesting and important question, especially as you think of additional uh, ways that have maybe have nothing to do with gun legislation for solving crime or solving suicides. Other questions? Senator Benning. Good morning. Thanks for coming. Um, to get to our bill, I made one particular note. Your data was talking about three to ten day waiting periods. Our bill is calling for 24 hours. Assuming the cooling off period is the underlying driver of the conversation, would it be fair then to say that the lower 
waiting period of 24 hours would not produce the same results as those within the three to 10 day window you had? I think uh, what we could say with more certainty is that a shorter waiting period probably would be better than a longer waiting period uh, because if the logic is what we think it is, but it doesn't necessarily mean it would be worse. Right, so if the waiting period was five minutes, maybe we would all look into it that that seems too short. And a waiting period being 10 days instead of three didn't seem to make any additional benefit. But where exactly you draw the line uh, is, is not entirely known. Now, I think if we look at other research, it might help us adjudicate this. So I think there's uh, a lot of uh, research on suicides. And again, you can do all the to look it up or, or, or ask us to look it up, I guess. Um, which suggests that when people decide to make a decision to commit suicide, they usually act within the day. So, so if there's other auxiliary research, it might help us think about, okay, well, maybe delaying by a day or two days might be sufficient. But the only thing we can say with confidence is what's in, in, in our data. And then we have to make some educated guesses about where the line should or should be drawn. Um, does that get at the question that you're asking? Or, or it does. I, I didn't. Assuming the theory works, that the cooling off period, sure. the longer the cooling off period, the greater the possibility is of reducing numbers that I understand. Mm -hmm. But you have not actually applied your research to a 24-hour waiting period in addition to Vermont's actual numbers of suicides and homicides. Well, we haven't applied it to a because nobody has a 24 hour period before. So that was in the end of the data, so we couldn't apply it. Uh, with regards to Vermont, Vermont is in the data set. Uh, it's one of the states that's in it, but we look at it the entire country. Okay, okay that's right. Um, I had another question. Just, oh, with respect to those waiting periods of three to 10 days that you were analyzing, did you also take into account any other programming that might have been developed in that period of time? For instance, zero suicide, I don't know if you know anything about that program, but were there any uh, analysis that was conducted with respect to programming that might be co-joined with Joe's sure. waiting period? So two answers to that. Uh, I, I don't know that specific program, but two answers to your question. Well, one, uh, we did put in other policies, gun legislations that may have correlated, because often people don't just propose one gun policy, they propose multiple. So we added other gun policies to make sure it wasn't something else that's driving the effect. And unfortunately, we're not looking at those. We're only looking at waiting periods, and we're making our own attributions. We did, we've done that. The second thing I'll say is, for exactly that reason, which is we can't possibly know every other thing a state was thinking, doing, going through, implementing, which is why we had approach number two. That was precisely the reason we had the Brady Act natural experiment, because the Brady Act suddenly showing up, and as, as Mike said, exogenous here, from the outside, forcing a state to have a waiting period that they weren't planning to have it, eliminates that correlation that people that have waiting periods are also doing a bunch of these other things at the same time. The beauty of that second approach, the need for that second approach, is exactly uh, to address the kinds of questions that you're raising now, which I think are fantastic questions, and too often research misses those pieces, that there could just be other things that are happening alongside that you didn't pick up. So that's why you run an experiment. And if you can't run an experiment, sometimes you get lucky and the world creates an experiment for you, and that's what we exploited in our, in our research. Okay, thank you. Okay. Extremely helpful, uh, frankly, and I, I just thank you so much for making the trip up trip. trip. Well, you had a great day to try us. Assuming you drove. We drove. Uh, it was a good book drive. We were good drive. Uh, yeah. He was complaining about the company he had, but. You've <laughs> probably been in each other's company for a lot. Yeah. I'm having such a short Fascinated by how, <laughs> by how you started this conversation, and there is another gentleman who is part of your team yes, who's yes. obviously not here from UCLA, yes. and his his involvement in this is similar? Or no? uh, so, so Chris, uh, by the way, uh, I, I could not say enough great things about uh, Chris as, as a scholar and as, as a human being. He was a PhD student at the time we started this work at Harvard, and uh, he really helped us go from the transition we made from 
try to understand before we just jump in uh, and try to do one of those things. Like really understanding the layout when we were transitioning to actually doing the academic work that led to this paper. Chris was a huge part of the team. He was the one who really helped us understand what previous things had maybe not done the research well and what, how to code the data better. And, and so he is uh, an equal part, I would say, in, in the way we think about this. Um, just as an aside, a lot of these papers that get published in the economics world, uh, we often uh, have to just alphabetically uh, name the authors. So just because somebody shows up last and doesn't show up in a room like this doesn't mean they're not like one of the great groups. So Chris Pollock is he's, he's great. He, he's, he's very excellent. In fact, we discussed with him before we came here today uh, what we're going to be doing and, and, and got his thoughts and any things that he thought that we should uh, emphasize as well. So, Thank you so much. Uh, Senate Judiciary, unless there's other questions, we're going to take a break until 1130 and meet in the committee room. You want to do so. Well, thank you. Um, Senate Health and Welfare will uh, return to room 17 right now and will probably adjourn by 11.15.